Welcome to Navicent Knows Health. I'm Cindy Busby and I'm here today with Dr. Mohammed Khan. He's a board certified internal medicine and pulmonary critical care doctor. And today we're gonna to talk about his intensivist practice and pulmonary practice here in Central Georgia. Dr. Khan, when it comes to taking care of patients in intensive care, what is the role of a pulmonologist in the critical care environment? I think there's a lot of overlap. So if you think about it, uh, most of these patients who are coming to the ICUs will have breathing problems, mm -hmm. respiratory problems. That means they would be on some level of oxygen. Mm -hmm. They could be on life support like ventilators. Mm -hmm. They could be on BiPAP, which is like a big mask that you put people on. They can have pneumonias. They can have fluid in their lungs. So, so there is a lot of overlap. And as a, as a pulmonologist, I mean, I feel like I have I have the understanding of what's going on with their lungs. Because lungs and this body cavity over here, uh, you have your heart, you have your body, you have your lungs. I mean, blood circulates through here. So a lot of things are, you know, correlated. So I feel like there is a huge role. Um, procedures, for example, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these ICU patients would require procedures like bronchoscopies, okay. uh, intubations, uh, chest tubes, and as a pulmonologist, I can provide all those services as well. Mm -hmm. When it comes to what a pulmonologist works on, is it strictly the lungs, so anything that affects your breathing, or uh, uh, like you said, coughing, all those things, is it only really associated with just lungs, or is there another part uh, in terms of circulation? So, pulmonologist, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, chest medicine, uh, mm -hmm. that would include a lot of pulmonary diseases, but we have to realize that just because somebody has lung problems, they would not have other problems. These are interrelated, right? Mm -hmm. For example, many of our COPD patients, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, uh, emphysema patients who have been on long-term steroids can have um, osteoporosis, which is, you know, their bones can get weak. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them can end up having thrush in their mouth. Uh, a lot of our other you know systemic diseases for example sarcoidosis which is you know one of the rare lung diseases mm -hmm. can affect other organs like your eyes can affect your skin can affect your bone it can affect your joints mm -hmm. um, for example lupus SLE you know very common in females uh, can have severe lung disease where patients can have bleeding inside their lungs mm -hmm. they can have what we call interstitial lung disease mm -hmm. and it affects other organs like kidneys it can affect their skin it can affect their brain so a lot of systemic diseases have uh, pulmonary complications and as a pulmonologist my role is not only to look at lungs but look at the body as a whole and make sure that they are doing well and make sure that they are followed up adequately mm -hmm. When it comes to your role as an intensivist in critical care, are you the captain of the way that a medicine is done in teams in the intensive care environment, or does it depend on the admission and the disease or medical condition of the patient? So with medical center, our model is a closed ICU, mm -hmm. meaning that whenever, whenever the patient is transferred to the intensive care unit, mm -hmm. the intensive care team takes over. Mm -hmm. So me and my colleagues are basically, once the patient gets transferred to us, are responsible. Uh, it's a team effort. I mean, it's not just myself. It's a shared decision-making process where you have a very complicated patient that has multiple organs that are affected. That's why they're in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So our goal, I mean, I don't consider myself as the captain, but yes, when it comes to final decision making, it's my team and my decision when it's come to taking care of the patient. But having said that, it's always a shared decision. You know, you want to have input from all the experts and do the right thing for the patient. Mm -hmm. So, and it has shown that in a closed ICU model, the outcomes for the patient are better in terms of, you know, their length of stay, how long they stay in the ICU, utilization of services, uh, so, and, and for that reason, Medical Center has moved towards coming up with a closed ICU model where there's one team in charge of the patient, basically. Mm -hmm. What's the role of the family in the uh, team concept for patients you care for? If you review the literature, there is called what we call A, B, C, D, E, and F bundle. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which is basically how we say uh, a patient focused approach in terms of uh, in, uh, it's mainly defined for a patient who gets confused in the ICU, gets delirious, mm -hmm. but that A, B, C, D, E, F, the F part of the bundle is basically family. Okay. The reason is because if think about, consider a scenario where you have a patient who's, you know, elderly, uh, who has been on medications, who's sick, has an infection, and, and, and because of that, they get confused now. And now they have new faces, a new doctor and a nurse, and they're not in their familiar environment. And, and I think it gets very important to see familiar faces, hear familiar voices, see their loved ones. I think that becomes very important as family members. I consider family members as part of the team. Mm -hmm. So not just for decision making uh, for a patient who cannot decide from this, for themselves, but also uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, because remember, once the patient gets better, they go home, it's the family member who has to take care of the patient. And if they are involved and know that my father has hypertension, diabetes, he's recovering from an infection, he has very high risk for fall. So if they are involved from the very beginning, they can be educated. And when they go home, they can be on, you know, on top of taking care of their loved ones. What's the role that your clinic, your pulmonary practice plays in either taking care of them after they're discharged or even for people with other diseases? My clinic is, I mean, it's called Advanced Lung Clinic. Mm -hmm. So most of the clinic patients are basically coming from community with some percentage also coming from the inpatient practice. Uh, the heaviest focus right now is lung cancer screening and diagnosis and then follow up once they have been diagnosed with lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a shared clinic where we you know uh, you know a patient walks in uh, because the, they were high risk and the primary care ordered a CAT scan based on the guidelines and now they have a nodule nodule means that they have a spot on their lung identified on the CAT scan mm -hmm. so when they come to us my role as a pulmonologist is to see if they are high risk versus if they are low risk based on their risk factor then we have to def decide what would be the next step. Should we go do the biopsy, you know, or should they just go and not have anything done and just have a follow-up with a repeat CAT scan? So those are very complicated decisions that, you know, we have to make in the clinic. On top of that, Advanced Lung Clinic uh, also focus on patients with rare diseases. For example, somebody who needs a lot of attention. For example, I was telling you earlier about systemic diseases like mm -hmm. uh, sarcoid mm -hmm. or, or what, there's another entity called interstitial lung diseases where you have uh, you know, patients with lung disease for unknown reason called IPF mm -hmm. or, you know, lung disease from any other systemic disease. Uh, say, you know, I have a lot of autoimmune patients who have autoimmune diseases and now it's affected their lungs. Mm -hmm. So those are the patients that I'm seeing in my clinic. Third thing that we have very recently started in the clinic is basically uh, looking at pleural diseases. Pleural disease basically, so you have lung and you have the outer covering of the lung. So a lot of these lung cancer patients can have fluid in their lungs. Mm -hmm. So what my focus now is that instead of them waiting to see, uh, you know, somebody who can remove their fluid, get an appointment and then see them and then have their fluid removed, I have started doing that in the clinic where I can just use an ultrasound, stick a needle, remove the fluid out. Well, as we go into lung cancer month in November, you talk a little bit about the screening CTs or a CT someone might have and find a lung nodule. Where does the screening for lung cancer intersect with your, with your practice? If you have a patient who is anywhere between 55 to 80 years of age, had at least 30 pack year smoking history, mm -hmm. active smoker, or hasn't quit in the last 15 years, uh, you know, based on the task force guidelines, they should have a low-dose CT scan for diagnosing lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, most of these are done, I mean, th that can be done. So if you know that your patient is high risk, mm -hmm. just send them to me and we can take over uh, in the clinic. And that's what has happened in the past where the primary care would just refer the patient to us for you know, getting a CT scan and then following up. Or on, on more commonly it happens is that, you know, our, our primary care providers would order the CAT scan, mm -hmm. 
get a nodule and once the nodule is diagnosed, they refer the patient to me and then I'm responsible for following them up for the rest of the period. Mm -hmm. um, to the time they either we diagnose a cancer or either we have had enough follow-up where we say, this is stable, this is not growing, it's probably nothing. Because you have to remember, 95% of the time, a nodule is just a nodule and not a cancer. Oh. Yeah, but that 5% of the population, if you sit on it, they go from stage one where you have 92% survival to stage four where you have no survival mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's that 5% is why I'm doing my clinic to, to focus on. And also as an intensivist, you know, sort of more timely, your work in intensive care around COVID patients, can you talk a little bit about the role of the pulmonologist and the intensivist uh, in taking care of patients and and how we were able to do that in central Georgia and to uh, save many, as you talked about. So when COVID started, me and my colleagues, you know, there was a slew of data that was coming from everywhere, you know, try this medication, try that strategy and all those things. We as a group came together and we said that we will stick to the evidence. Yeah. Were the COVID units um, closed in the sense that we put them into ICUs, obviously medical ICUs, I'm guessing, and we use the, the closed model there right. as well. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So our, so at one point we had three COVID units that were working full, mm -hmm. uh, full flesh with, uh, you know, maximum capacity for the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yes, they were closed and uh, once they got transferred out to, uh, you know, floor, mm -hmm. my, you know, uh, you know, the floor doctors will follow up and then, you know, eventually they get discharged and some of them, not all of them, but some of them I would see in clinic as well, basically. So. That was going to be my follow-up question. So if you're seeing some of those COVID patients um, in terms of long-term effects, do you think this is going to be a new demographic of, of patients that you will see in your clinic practice as well? So again, the, the answer is unclear, mm -hmm. but studies that have you know come out have suggested that uh, a lot of young patients have had symptoms for many many months even after they had the virus clear mm -hmm. now would that mean that they would have it long term long term meaning for years years and years or would they have would this have permanent disability those are things that we just don't know mm -hmm. as of yet uh, again um, we just don't know enough but a lot of times when you have respiratory failure for such a long period of time, mm -hmm. uh, you can have what we call lung fibrosis where you know your lung starts to get scarred. Mm -hmm. So we may see some of that in the population. Now to what extent? That's one thing we don't know yet. All right. Well, thank you for telling us so much about your practice. Yeah. Thank you very much and uh, I, I really appreciate giving me the opportunity to mm -hmm. be here. Sure thing. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at Navicent Knows Health. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Khan and his pulmonary practice, please visit us at navicenthealth.org.